As we begin 20th century art, one of the things you'll notice about modernism of the first half of the 20th century are the dual characteristics of abstraction and originality. The desire for the artist to try to do something that is new, that is not just repeating something that has been done before, uh, maybe for centuries. Now, there are many art movements in the 20th century. And what I'm doing is giving you a list of just some of those art movements to about the middle of the 20th century, to about the 1950s. We're going to start with Fauvism, which is a French expressionistic art movement. In 1906, there was an art exhibit that showed this work of art and uh, a number of other artists. And one of the critics came and he hated it. He looked at it and he said that these works were fauve, which means wild beast or savage, or untamed. Uh, fauve can be used either as a noun or as an adjective. And so, the artist took as the name of their art movement Fauveism, which is a French expressionistic art movement that emphasizes the idea of bright colors exciting the emotions. Now, here you can see this work that so upset the critic. Uh, it's Matisse's Joy of Life from 1906. And I'm comparing it to Gauguin, and I'm, and I'm comparing it to Gauguin's Day of the Gods from 1894, just to show you how post-impressionism, Gauguin, uh, influenced the Fauves. Um, as you can see, uh, Gauguin is showing some nude figures. This is from the period uh, when he went to Tahiti. And the colored shapes in the foreground are supposed to be uh, the colored pieces of fabric that the women are washing in the water. But as you can see, they form these um, very amorphous and very colorful shapes. Well, when you compare the Gauguin with the Matisse, you see nude figures in a landscape. Uh, and in both cases, they have been simplified. But Matisse carries it even further. Um, he simplifies the forms into primarily flat shapes, uh, curving forms, and extremely bright colors. Gauguin was part of a group called the Symbolists, who were interested in the symbolic and emotional uh, use of color. And of course, Matisse and the Fauves carry that even further. Henri Matisse was a French painter, but he also created sculpture, collage, ceramic decorations, um, decorations of vestments even. When we look at his painting of the joy of life, you see, of course, the bright colors which were believed to stimulate the emotions. The subject is very traditional. It's a pastoral subject. The subject of Matisse's joy of life is a traditional subject. It goes back in Greek and Roman literature to the idea of a golden age, a perfect time when everyone lived in peace and harmony. And it's usually expressed as a pastoral subject, pastor meaning shepherds. So the idea was that the shepherds and the nymphs, the shepherdesses, uh, just uh, made love, made music, danced, uh, had a wonderful time, and I, I guess the sheep and the goats just took care of themselves. Um, so this is a, a kind of fantasy um, that has a long history in literature and art. Now, we said that with the phobes, the bright colors stimulate the emotions. And as you can see, Matisse uses abstraction to simplify the forms. You have 
human figures that are uh, curving shapes, curving lines, uh, they seem flattened, uh, they are in poses that imply that they can move in space, but there's little or no chiaroscuro. And here you see it closer. Um, and then showing you another work by Matisse. Um, this is from the year before, and as you can see, he's using thicker brushwork. Uh, you can really see the brush strokes, uh, but very vibrant with the color. And there is that idea of arbitrary color, that you don't have to use the colors of what the object is. So he paints the woman's face with green. Uh, and of course, you can see the different colors of her clothing and the colors in the background. These can be chosen for compositional reasons, for emotional reasons. They can be chosen as the artist sees fit. In Germany, there were many different groups of artists who uh, can be grouped under the broader category of German Expressionism. I already said we had German Expressionism in the 14th century. Well, here we're talking about early, uh, here we're talking about early 20th century uh, German Expressionism. So that idea of abstraction and emotionalism. Um, sometimes the groups of artists would get together and they would pick a name for their group. One was called Die Brücke, the bridge, or Der Blau Reiter, which is the blue writer. Now that movement was organized in 1911 by Vesele Kandinsky, and that's the artist I'm going to talk about. Uh, it was devoted to this idea of the emotional power of color. Now, Vesele Kandinsky lived in Germany, um, but he was a Russian. He taught at the Bauhaus in Dessau in Germany. Uh, the Bauhaus was one of the most important art, architectural, and design schools, uh, institutions. And it was extremely influential on 20th century design. They had a number of ideas uh, that had to do with new, modern um, materials and a simplified uh, aesthetic. For example, uh, they believed that you should have good design, not just in artwork, but in the things that people use every day. So some of the artists from the Bauhaus designed furniture some of them designed dishes. And of course, they're very, very uh, famous for uh, their architecture, for what is often called the international style of architecture in the 20th century. If you think of the skyscrapers with uh, steel frame construction and windows and sort of very simplified uh, geometric shapes, um, that probably develops out of the Bauhaus. Uh, some of the artists that are associated, some of the most famous architects of the 20th century, such as Mies van der Rohe, are associated with the Bauhaus. Okay, back to Kandinsky. Kandinsky wasn't an architect. He was the painting professor. And one of the things that he would do with his works of art is give them musical titles, titles that could be the title of a musical composition or a musical improvisation, or a fugue. And he usually gives these uh, numbers. So we have here improvisation number 28 from 1912, and composition number 238, Bright Circle. And that's from 1921. And here you're looking closer at it. And as you look at this, you might notice that that doesn't really seem to describe anything in the visible world. If you use your imagination, you might say, well, are those supposed to be very tall buildings? Is that supposed to be a mountain? Is that kind of amorphous shape, a gear? What is this? Well, we're making up a subject that isn't really there. Now, why did Kandinsky use musical titles? Well, 
Think about it this way. If you go to a concert or a symphony, you've probably never heard someone come out of the symphony and say, well, that's terrible. That's just, just a fraud. I didn't hear anything that sounded like the world around me. They were just abstract sounds. They, they, they didn't sound like wind or uh, jackhammers or birds twittering or anything I've ever heard. They just, it just was abstract. No one expects musicians to imitate exactly the sounds of the physical world around us. But some people do expect artists to do that. And so what Kandinsky is doing is claiming the right of visual artist to compose with pure form. In other words, with the artistic elements. Composition, style, it doesn't need a subject in the visible world. Okay, let's go back in time just a little bit. You say, why are you putting that picture up? It's late 19th century. It's realistic. Okay, this is a painting by James Whistler, who was an American artist who lived in Britain. And I know you've seen reproductions of this picture and, and you've heard that called Whistler's Mother. But that's not what Whistler called it. He gave it a title and the title was An Arrangement in Gray and Black. An arrangement, a composition. And then he names the two most prominent colors, gray and black. So, you know, what he's saying to you is not, here I am giving you a reproduction of a portrait of my mother. He's saying, this is a painting. What's a painting? It's arrangement of the visual elements and it's arrangement of shapes and colors, textures. So, although he's using a realistic image, his title suggests the same kind of thing that, you know, Kandinsky was later to expand on. You know, that artists work with the visual elements. Now, here's another painting by Whistler. Nocturne in black and gold. Well, look at that. C can you figure out what it is? Do you see a subject there? Well, if I had lied to you and told you that that was a 1950s abstract expressionist work, you might very well have believed me. And if I said, oh, there's no subject there, you might believe me. Not quite true. But look at the title he gave it, a nocturne. That's used for musical compositions. It means night, so you're seeing a night scene. And then once again, he mentions colors. Well, this painting actually has a subtitle. The Falling Rocket, which identifies the subject. If you don't put that subtitle in, you might think it's just an arrangement of colors on the canvas. So it appears to be non-representational, but it does have a subject from the visible world, the falling rocket. It's a picture of fireworks, essentially. But Whistler calls it a nocturne in black and gold, a night scene using particular colors. So once again, he's drawing your attention to the fact that this is painting and, you know, painting deals with the visual elements, including color. So Kandinsky goes even further. He creates artwork that is non-representational. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean artwork that has no subject from the material world, the physical world, the visible world. There's a lot of different names that people use for this. Uh, non-representational is probably the most descriptive. 
when I was in school, I learned the term non-objective or non-objectivity, uh, that it has no object in the visible world, so it was non-objective art. Uh, some people will say total abstraction, sort of distinguishing it from the abstraction where you can still make out figures and objects to when you actually do not paint figures and objects. Now, Kandinsky starts out with uh, very soft-edged forms, as you can see on the left, uh, and then he moves to hard-edged forms, some of which are more geometric. And then there's that question, well, which artist in Western art first created a work of art that is non-objective? Well, when I was in school, Kandinsky usually got the credit. I did have one teacher who told me that she thought that it was Arthur Dove, who was a American artist. So I don't think they sit down and say, okay, what were the different time zones at what week or day? Maybe they don't know for sure which artist created the very first non-objective uh, painting. But Kandinsky gets the credit because he wrote the book on it, quite literally wrote the book. Uh, it's, of course, it's written in German, um, but it would translate as concerning the spiritual in art. So what is he doing? He's not only claiming that artists should be as free as musicians to create art that is without representation in the visible world, but he's saying that this non-objective, non-representational art refers to the spiritual side of humanity. Now, there's a long history of human beings uh, thinking about themselves as both body and spirit. The ancient Egyptians you know, had a ka that could separate from the body at death. Um, Plato, you know, the ancient Greeks talk about it. The idea that there is more than just the material or physical side of things. And Kandinsky thought that this kind of art was essentially anti-materialistic. Anti It was more spiritual. Well, let's look at those words for a minute. Sometimes when people think about spirituality, they associate it with religion and sometimes with a particular religion. But that's not really accurate. Um, religions, there's all sorts of religions. Religions may try to understand or sometimes even codify the spiritual. But they often have all sorts of other elements. Um, they may have uh, doctrines that people expect people to believe. Or they may have a hierarchy. They ha have rites and rituals. But spirituality doesn't need rites and rituals and, and doesn't have doctrines. So Kandinsky's not really talking about a religion. He's talking about... Um, the side of humanity that is beyond the material world, whatever that might be. Now, I've often wondered if when we look back at the 20th century, and maybe the 21st century as well, what will we call it? We probably can't go on calling it modern art because... Well, we had modern art in the 15th century. They called it the Ars Moderna. But of course, new types of modernism replaced that. So we talk about modern art in the 20th century. But we also sometimes give names of historical periods. We talk about the Gilded Age or the Age of Enlightenment or the age of discovery. 
I've wondered whether when we look back at the 20th century, we'll be talking about the age of materialism. And if so, Kandinsky is trying to set his non-objective art against the materialism of society. I also wanted to show you um, a work of one of my favorite 20th century artists, who is Kathy Kollwitz. Uh, she is a German printmaker and sculptor. And I think she's the finest draftsperson of the 20th century. Um, probably, I would think that Daumier would be the finest draftsperson of the 19th century. I would say that Kathy Colwitz is the finest draftsperson of the 20th century. Now that's an opinion maybe not everyone would agree with me, but she certainly gives you these emotional themes that really have a strong impact. And here you see one of her many self-portraits. And when you look at this, you'll notice that she has the structure of the face. You know, it looks very realistic, very three-dimensional. And then when you look at the graphic elements, the way the lines are laid out, uh, there's these places where the lines at the edge uh, become absolutely scribbly. Uh, and, and there's where the, the abstraction of the line comes in. So she's not going to be as abstract as the works we've seen before. It's always based on a very solid form of you know, knowledge of the human figure, for example. And in a sense, metaphorically, of the human heart. In other words, um, the emotions that human beings experience. In the late 19th century and the early 20th century, Kollwitz created two print series that were based on German history. In the late 19th century, there was the weavers, and here we see in the 20th century, the peasants' war. Now, both of these are historical events when workers rose up against their oppressors. By putting them in a historical context, she can comment on what's going on in her own time and place. And these images can be universal. They can be applied to other events in history. But rather than come out and directly criticize her society of the day or criticize the Kaiser, it's historical. So she could even win an award for it. Um, and you know, people who could see the parallels would understand. This image uh, is called Outbreak or Uprising because it's in German. You, you see it translates several different ways. It's from the series of the Peasants' War and it is an etching. Uh, Colwitz worked with all different printmaking media. She worked with etching and woodcut and lithograph. Now, the Peasants' War was an uprising in Germany uh, in 1525. The German serfs, um, as the serfs all over Europe, were very oppressed. Uh, they were the workers in the field. Uh, they were the persons who you know, were essentially the basis of the economy and, and food and you know, life for uh, those above them. Uh, but they had no rights. A serf was almost the same as a slave. Not entirely, because you could not sell the person, the peasant or the serf, away from his land. It's not his land, it's the aristocrat's land, but away from the land that he works on. But pretty much the landowners could do anything they wanted. If there was a bad harvest, they could take it all. You know, they, there was no restriction. 
And the peasants lived at subsistence or even below subsistence living. And at one point, they had had about as much as they could take, and they rose up, they killed the aristocratic landlords, and they went on a, a rampage, if you will. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the upper classes, the bishops, the aristocrats, got together an army, and they put down the peasants. Anyone who wasn't slaughtered, any of them who weren't, wasn't killed uh, in the battles, uh, was impaled. So it did not end well for the peasants. Now, it's interesting to see what historical people, people who lived at the time of the Peasants' War, uh, felt about it. There's one of the most wonderful sculptors ever named Tilman Riemenschneider, who is a German sculptor uh, in Würzburg um, in the late 15th and the early 16th centuries. He was the Burgemeister or the mayor of Würzburg for a while, but when he sympathized with the peasants during the Peasants' War, he was imprisoned. Another very famous figure of the time was Martin Luther. Now, you might expect Luther to have some sympathy for these oppressed workers. After all, one of the ideas uh, that gave them um, the thought that they might have some, what, rights uh, were some of Luther's teachings. You know, he talked about the priesthood of all believers. And, you know, he supported the idea that people could read the gospel in their own language and, and, and think about it. I think he thought everyone would agree with him when they read the gospel, but, you know, this was an idea. Now, the peasants couldn't read, most of them. Most of them couldn't read. Um, but there is that idea of the individual and his worth. And that's somehow percolated down to the peasants. But Martin Luther wrote a diatribe against the peasants who participated in the Peasants' War. It wasn't just that they shouldn't have killed people. It was that they should stay in the place where God put them, which was a very common medieval idea. You know, the divine right of kings, God decides who will be king. Um, and, you know, God decides if you're going to be, you know, a poor serf. It is a little ironic in a way uh, because Luther comes from a peasant family. Now, I'm not sure, his father may have been a free peasant, and he actually was a minor, but he was able to become a wealthier uh, peasant and had hopes that his son might be a lawyer. Uh, as it was, of course, his son uh, became a monk and then got a university education and became a professor of theology and one of the most famous people in history. Um, but Luther himself rose from humble origins, and yet he had no sympathy uh, with the plight of the oppressed peasant. So. This is supposed to be 1525, but I think you can see that this image could be used universally to express the frustration that just comes forth when people have been oppressed. And what you're seeing is almost, it's, it almost looks like a, a triangle or an arrow of the workers as though, you know, they've been pushed back and now all of that frustration and suffering is just let go and they're rising forth, they're running off. And so there's this strong diagonal search of movement and these very powerful graphic elements. You know, you can look at this and see realistic images uh, of the faces and the bodies of the figures. And then you have, of course, this, for, uh, this foreground figure, 
this repoussoi figure, if you will. Um, the woman who is standing with her arms raised as though she's just called for the peasants to rush forward. That's the figure of Black Anna, who was a historical figure. She was one of the women uh, who called for the peasants' war. She was one of the peasants. And Kathy Kowitz uses herself as the model for this figure. We don't see her face in this particular print. We only see the back. And you can look at it as both abstract, or you can look at it and see the complete understanding of anatomy. Uh, you see uh, graphic elements, lines that you know almost seem to be scribbly, but they, they build up the form. And I just wanted to show you something by Colwitz in another medium, and this is one of the prints that I particularly uh, like. Uh, it's called The Mothers, and this one is a woodcut. And you can see the mothers who are huddling together trying to protect their children. She sometimes will take the same theme, such as the mothers, and um, work it in different media. So here's the woodcut. She also did a lithograph and a statue uh, with uh, the same kind of idea of this um, unified group of suffering women and children.